What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Data Dash, and today is April 8th of 2020. Well folks, I hope y'all are having a fantastic day wherever you are, and in today's video, I wanna spend some time to do a bit of a rant and a rave. I usually do these from time to time when I feel they're necessary here on the channel, and it has to do with a response to a lot of people out there who were concerned that I was focusing on too long of a time horizon when it comes to either my predictions or just my outlook on cryptocurrency markets. A lot of it came in response with one of my recent videos where I talked about how I believe cryptocurrency markets will most likely, according to historical data, top out around $100,000. The target that I've had for some time for cryptocurrency markets for the next cycle, sometime in late 2022. So a good time window out from where we are right now in order to really reach that market peak. And some people, again, had issued that that was, uh, you know, too long of a time horizon, that I wasn't focusing enough on the short term. And I think it really warrants me to spend some time to explain why I focus on the macro cycles, the longer term perspectives, and why, again, I try not to pinpoint what's going to happen tomorrow or in the next week or so, okay? So anyways, in the sense of short term news, guys, crypto markets haven't moved too much since we last did a video. So I thought I'd just go ahead and jump straight to the point on this. All right. So the first thing here I want to talk about is the criticism that I might not talk enough about short term perspectives. And if we're talking about day to day moves, yeah, I'm not really going to be analyzing what's happening in the next 24 hours. Sorry. I know the vast majority of my audience isn't here for the next 24 hours because I know many of you out there are either hodlers or people who are like myself, probably swing traders over longer term horizons. And even if you're trading actively, uh, in this case, you're probably trading over a weekly or monthly time frame, not doing anything too severe. Again, more swing trading rather than day trading. I tend not to do that here on the channel. And I know the vast majority of you out there aren't doing it or the vast majority of you day trading out there are most likely to lose especially if you're toying around with margin, which I'm gonna bring up here in just a moment to my point about long-term training. Now, if you're talking about short-term uh, you know, kind of analysis, I've been doing that here on the channel. If you're talking about over the course of the next few weeks, the next few months, talking about where I could see price going, I just talked about that in my other video, the Bitcoin halving, where I discussed how I believe that we are going to continue this rally we're in right now. We're currently in the upper, the lower $7,000 range, around $7,300 to $7,200. And I believe that we're going to continue that up somewhere towards the upper $9,000 range in the halving event in May. And then afterwards, we're going to get a pullback down actually where my mouse is pointing right there around the mid $7,000 range to set a higher low from the line of support that's been holding for the longer period of time. And that we're going to continue outside of the wedge here that's been building up ever since the peak and a general kind of bottom range here of the uh, overall cycle. And then we're going to reach out to going back up to 20,000 sometime in uh, 2021. And then we're going to continue onward in 2022 up to our new highs, uh, up towards $100,000 for Bitcoin. As the momentum really kicks in and the halving is already well priced in. And the, uh, the, the momentum starts building in as there's a shift in demand from the overall available supply that comes from the Bitcoin mining in this case. So. Again, we talk about these things because I try to cover short term, but I want to drill that point again. I'm not going to talk about the day to day. Crypto markets are so volatile. Remember back in early March when we had the second worst sell off day for Bitcoin and the worst sell off day for Ethereum? You think anyone could have predicted that? I mean, let's, I'm just being real with you guys because I know many of you probably share that mindset, but I, I want to reach to everyone in the space because I'm here for you guys. I'm trying to be as honest as I can. And I want to draw this point that for the vast majority of people, you're going to lose out if you're trying to day trade and you're trying to predict these markets. I don't care what indicators you have. I don't care what trading strategies. The vast majority of day traders are going to lose money. And even if you can make money day trading, the argument always stands that you'll most likely do better. And I always recommend people do this. If you're going to start day trading, start with a smaller percentage of your portfolio and see whether or not you outpace your overall long-term portfolio, not in the sense of uh, overall returns, but on a percentage gain. So if I make more day trading, and I feel that the time commitment that I have to put up to day trading than just long-term holding, and probably a little bit of the element of stress that's involved is worth it, then go on ahead, be my guest. If it shows consistency, then definitely do it. I don't wanna discourage anyone from taking upon financial opportunities that they feel are best for them. I'm not your financial advisor at the end of the day, right? All I can do is just provide my perspective to you guys as an audience, right? I'm just one person. Now that we got that clear, I wanna go ahead and talk a little bit about the longer term perspective and why there's so many key reasons that it's better to focus on the long term, okay? Now we talked about the majority of people who are day trading 
in crypto markets, in forex markets, in stock markets, commodity markets, whatever it is, the vast majority lose out. You can look at any study that's been done. You can you could simply just do a Google search. There are tons and I would say well over a dozen studies that have been done and some people have compiled them together that showcase the vast majority of day traders lose. There's no official statistic, we'll never know. It's somewhere in the upper 90% range for most markets, okay? So now that we understand that, let's take a look here at the profitable days for Bitcoin. The profitable days for Bitcoin takes into account the current price and anywhere back in history where prices have either been the same or lower. These are days where you're neutral on your investment into Bitcoin or you're up in the money, as every investor wants to be. Well, we can see here that a vast majority of Bitcoin's history, over 85%, really excluding the craziness of the and tail end of the bull market from back in 2017, and then also up here when we were trading somewhere around 10 to 12,000 to 14,000 dollars for Bitcoin, we're in the red in this case, but for the vast majority, we're in the green here. All right. So if you're not buying when everyone else is wanting to buy, when Bitcoin is absolutely trending and you know stylish and everyone wants to get a piece of the action, then you're likely up on your money. And this is a point that I always drill to people. There, there was a lot of great investors out there, and I saw some of you guys in the comments on uh, one of my previous videos, and I'm so proud to see that some of you out there who are viewers of the channel fit into this group of people. A lot of people added into their Bitcoin positions when probably no one wanted to buy Bitcoin. I remember, I visually remember I was in New York City and I was there meeting for uh, some stuff related to my startup. I was meeting a few investors and a few close contacts in the space. And I remember when we were at a, a meetup there, people were just losing faith in crypto. We thought, you know, again, we weren't thinking this was the end of the world. It was just going to be a rough patch for crypto. Some people, on the other hand, were like, oh my God, this whole thing's done for. And at the same time, while there were people who I knew who were more institutional or more retail investors, many of you out there who, again, are probably small, medium-sized investors, some of you may be large as well, were buying in. And that made me so proud because, as fr quite frankly, as much as I can't instruct you guys to buy anything, what I liked seeing was that you bought into fear. That is what a strategic investor tends to do. You buy when there's a discount. Right? You don't go shopping when uh, you know the new hot item is going to be you know marked up at a huge price. You go when it's at a discount, right? If you really want the utility of it, if you want the uh, you know in this case the the better price in this case for what you're buying, and the same goes for assets, right? Your risk to reward gets much favorable as prices go down. Uh, in most cases, again. That's not always relevant, but in this case, in crypto markets, if your time horizon is for that 100k price target, right? Your risk to reward from you know the seven to eight thousand level versus three or four thousand level. Three or four thousand is much more optimal. If you so long haven't seen any changes in the fundamentals, that everything is still according to plan, which it is. The halving event is still set into play here, right? That's another key thing to talk about here. Stock to flow model, right? A lot of people. I know, guys, it has been very, very time-consuming just to sit on the sidelines and wait for the next cycle. But that's what crypto does. Crypto has very short cycles where the vast majority of gains come in. And it has these long periods of time where it sits generally sideways alongside the stock-to-flow model. And we can see here as well, that's exactly what we've been doing over here. I think the biggest issue that we had was that we had too much of a precursor rally here where we went from 3,000 to 14,000 where people got a bit greedy and then it led us into a sideways pattern where we gave up a lot of those losses because we shouldn't have been that high that early on. Generally, it was caused from a short squeeze and a few other elements to understand that in the short term, right? Again, we'll never really know. Some people might have just bought in further anticipation. You know, again, it's 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 really irrelevant when we're focusing on what we care about, which is the next cycle here. Now, I also want to talk about something else. There were some people who brought up a very good critical point that pointed Nick. You know, you talk about the stock to flow model a lot, and you say that you know, for example, it, you know, if we take a look at the stock to flow model, that it peaks out in May of uh, 2021. Shouldn't that be where the cycle peaks? And I think it's a very good point. I bring up the stock to flow model a lot, but we need not look further than just simply taking a look at the stock to flow model to realize that Bitcoin tends not to peak, at least from the last cycle, at the point of the stock to flow model peaking. We can see here in the last cycle, for example, that in June of 2017, pushing into July, that's when the stock to flow model peaked at a fair value of around $5,400 for Bitcoin. But it actually took six months later in December, around five to six months, give or take, 
until Bitcoin actually peaked out in December of 2017 at nearly 20,000. So what does this tell us? Well, it tells us two things. One is something that uh, might you know, be a hindrance for some people, which is that I think that with each of these cycles, we're going to see a further expansion away from the peak of the stock to flow model, meaning that in this case, we're gonna see it sometime between the summer of 2022 towards our more conservative target of somewhere in November, or December of 2022, pushing towards 2023, right? Now, here's the good news though. Notice as well how the stock to flow model peaked out at a fair value around 5,600, 5,700. Bitcoin went up to 20,000, meaning our price target for the next peak of 100K is the conservative estimate according to the stock to flow model, right? You know, guys, there are people out there who are calling for 200,000, 250,000, 500,000, a million dollars. I'm just keeping it conservative at 100,000. We are keeping open to the idea that there could be a higher price target. It's just that around 100K, when we really enter into that parabolic phase here, I'm gonna start raising my stops. But the overall point here is that even if we just go to 100K, right, if that's the conservative tail end and we've got possibly higher numbers that we could go for, why would I wanna stress and try to day trade in the short term and try to call price targets before the, and after the halving event when this is programmatically fixed in to a degree with the halving event and the macro environment that's going to help shape Bitcoin as an emerging hedging asset? This is the point that I try to drill, guys. I know it might not be as sexy as making a 50% return overnight or in a week, right? You're not going to get that right now. Maybe when it comes to the full swing cycle, when we have altcoins that are rallying like crazy like they were back in 2017, perhaps, perhaps we'll get some of those crazy returns. But I can tell you all, as I've traded and invested in other markets, and as I've traded and invested in crypto, you not only need to be in the market at the right time for those things to happen, but it tends to be that those good returns that are you know, promised to traders and people who take excessive risk are usually too good to be true. And you'll most likely lose out. I don't want crypto to become much like a lot of other markets, to become a casino for most people where they end up losing money. I want people to realize the fundamental value here in Bitcoin and assets like Ethereum that, again, are providing a lot of value through the DeFi space and have recovered a lot of their losses in the short term. This is another point here. I talked about margin. You know, we're, we're talking about crypto being a casino. I see so many people taking on excessive risk in an already volatile market where they take on margin of over 50 to 100 times leverage in this case, meaning if prices go down 2 or 1%, you lose everything. And I know some people also say, well, Nick, I'm not actually doing that. I'm doing two to three times margin. And I got liquidated the other day. Yeah, it can happen, guys. I know it sounds terrible, but it's why I have stood so extensively against margin. And markets like Forex, understandable, because you're talking about pips, very small moves, and price action between different currency pairs, national currencies that have well-established economies. This is a new emerging asset class. It's the wild, wild west days of cryptocurrencies, to put it lightly. And even if you're going with two or three times margin, long or short, you can get liquidated easily. So if you're just hodling, on the other hand, you're about back to where you were back before the crazy sell-off. You can take a look here to the daily here on Ethereum. We're just, you know, 30 bucks short here of where we were before the crazy sell-off. If you're a hodler, you haven't lost that much. Even on, and technically you haven't lost anything. On paper, you're down 30 bucks if you'd entered in here. But the key thing I'm drilling here is that if you're trading on margin, you could have lost it all that day. And the exchanges who are providing that margin trading, quite frankly, they don't care about you or I. They don't care if you get liquidated. In fact, sometimes they love it when you get liquidated, right? At the end of the day, they don't care about you or I. But at the end of the day, I care about you guys. I really, really do. I've stayed away from margin. The only time I've ever dabbled with it is trading on like like small amounts on DeFi platforms just to test out some of these really exciting decentralized finance platforms that are taking away the control of centralized exchanges, which I like, and the trust of custodianship in a centralized exchange. We're not fully there yet, but I think there's a lot of really cool DeFi projects doing that. But I don't trade on margin on my positions, guys. 
The only thing that I do that would probably be seen as a risk on position is my altcoin positions. And so far, Chainlink has been a great performer. I've been up on my investment, all of my investments for Chainlink in this case. We also have as well a lot of other plays. Again, Ethereum is a broad play, but I would say as well we've got Ren, we've got Kyber Network, all these different altcoins that, generally speaking, even as altcoins have pulled back, they've actually done quite well, right? And you still get some good returns there. But above all, right, you know, I've rambled on about a few different points here, guys. So we talk about the broader picture here. I want to go ahead and emphasize why I focus above all on the longer term perspective. We can talk about the halving event. We can talk about, again, just longer term uh, horizons and taking on less stress. This is what I'm concerned about here. This is the Federal Reserve's expected balance sheet, according to Bank of America. With the Fed's already announced $4 trillion of stimulus, the largest form of QE we've ever seen, and likely further rounds of quantitative easing or other actions that might not be deemed under a round of QE, the Fed is projected to go towards $9 trillion sometime in 2020 or 2021. This is meaning over $4.5 trillion, nearly $4.5 trillion, a doubling of the balance sheet before COVID-19 and the Fed's balance sheet. Doubling of the quantitative easing and the newly printed money that's injected into the financial system. Quite frankly, I think this number is going to be higher. Maybe it might take a little bit longer, but I think that the Fed is going to keep adding. I think that we're going to have more federal stimulus in order to avoid uh, you know, a recession or depression by any regard. And what do you think all that newly printed money is going to do? Do you think it's just going to flock all the way to assets like stocks and properties? Or do you think some of that cash or maybe the pre-existing cash that's in the system is going to flock to an asset class that's going to protect its purchasing power, that's going to help it hedge against negative interest rates, which is the other element here that we're not talking about, where you'll be penalized to have money in a savings account. I think that it's going to go into an asset that's not going to penalize it for owning it, and along with that as well, is not going to be able to be printed into oblivion. Just for perspective, there are $9.2 trillion in deposit accounts, basically in savings accounts in the United States right now, earning nothing. And soon they're going to start earning a negative yield sitting in there in a bank account, doing nothing. It's as if savers haven't gotten screwed over enough already in the United States. What do you think those people are going to do? Many of you might be those Americans who have money in savings accounts. I know I've got a little bit in savings, but I try to get it out as quick as possible, just like smart investors, because I know that it's going to be depreciated either by just simply sitting there due to inflation or due to negative interest rates. Now you've got a double whammy against you being a saver. The risk that you take with Bitcoin kind of sounds a bit more favorable at this point, at least in my opinion. So anyways, I've drilled on a lot of points here, guys. That being said, I hope you all have enjoyed this video. And again, one thing I want to stress here, guys, if you are investing in cryptocurrencies, a key thing to keep in mind here at the end of the day is that you have to keep in mind taxes. So one of the things that we have for one of our sponsors here is TaxBit. Now, again, if you guys haven't been able to really go through the process of managing your taxes, it can be a bit complex if you've got a lot of exchanges. TaxBit is a great platform for that. You just basically generate API keys from all your exchanges. It's a free process and you plug them into TaxBit where they can view the account in this case and basically process your tax forms for you all in one simplified form. They're a really great company. I know Austin, the founder, done a lot of great stuff. And again, they really help you step uh, step by step throughout the process. And there's different tax packages in this case where you can get much more on-hand support through the TaxBit team, where you can get real CPAs to analyze it and actually help you through the process or if you're going through an IRS audit in this case. So there's a lot of great stuff that they offer. All right? So I really recommend you guys check out TaxBit. We've got a link down below in the description where you can get a discount on any of the tax packages and help support the channel. But all in all, guys, that's it for the video. I hope you all enjoyed this rant and rave that I did. If you liked it, please drop a like, please drop a comment. And even if you didn't, right, if you got something to say, guys, put it in the comments down below, right? I'm, I'm here to listen to all of you. I really wanna get genuine comments from you guys. I wanna have a real genuine relationship with you guys because I'm here more than anything to just help you guys. I, I, I have no incentive at the end of the day in this case to try to get you into short-term trading, right? I care more than anything about you guys making returns in the long term, doing well, and learning about the fundamentals of cryptocurrency markets, plain and simple. I'm here for the long term. 
I've been cre creating videos every, not every single day, but about four or five videos every week here, even during a pretty dull market for the most part, because I love this space and I'll always love being here with you guys. It's never about, yeah, okay, I've, I've invested in other markets, I've made money before, yeah, it's nice, but this is an exciting market. This is an exciting time. We're witnessing the birth of a new asset class. And every day, it's still very, very exciting to me. It doesn't get old. That's the really magical thing about crypto is that it's just, it's so uh, volatile, not in the sense of its price, but in the sense of its potential. Like every day, there's always something new coming out. And that's the really exciting thing to know is that we're here during this process with DeFi emerging out of Ethereum, with Bitcoin continuing to test itself against the stock to flow model to see if it can be that global store of value, that global world reserve currency. I'm interested to see if it can do that. And I'm happy to know that you all are here with me in that journey. And if, for those of you who might be here for the first time, definitely consider subscribing, hitting the bell icon, join the Datadash family. It's always appreciated. And I try to produce as much free content as I can here on the channel for you guys to learn more and more so you can become smarter investors at the end of the day. All right. Anyways, that's it for the video, everyone. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Stay tuned.